In this lecture, we're going to look at the surface anatomy of the abdomen. So we're going to look at various surface landmarks which we can observe on the anterior and lateral aspects of the abdomen. We're going to use these landmarks to create various reference planes and regions, and then using these regions, locate the position of organs within the abdomen. For example, we'll look at where the appendix is located and where the liver is. And then finally, towards the end of the lecture, we're going to importantly look at the sensory distribution, how the skin of the abdomen receives its sensory innovation and how this passes back to the spinal cord. And this is important when we're looking at the distribution of pain from pathologies within the abdomen and the viscera of the abdominal um, organs. So on the screen at the moment, we can see the body plan of the male and the female. And we're really going to be concentrating on this region, which we can see here in the male, the abdomen, and also which we can see in the female. So this abdominal region that's positioned inferior to the thorax. And on here, we can pick out a series of important landmarks, some of which we can feel on ourselves. And we can start off superiorly with the xiphoid process, which in the male we can see is here, and in the female we can see is about here. We can feel this landmark on ourselves if you feel your sternum in your thoracic cavity, and go inferiorly, and where it stops, that point is your xiphoid process. Radiating laterally away from this process, we have the costal cartilages of ribs 7, 8, 9 and 10. And these radiate away in this direction in the male, and similarly they do so in the female. And this marks the superior boundary of the abdomen. Inferiorly, we have a few landmarks which we can observe. Again, in the midline, in the male and the female, we have the pubic crest and the pubic symphysis. We'll see these later on when we go into the pelvis and we look at the bones of the pelvis. And radiating away from the pubic crest and pubic symphysis, we find we have the inguinal ligaments. We have these two ligaments, one on either side, and these form the inferior boundary of the abdomen. So here we can see the superior and the inferior boundaries of the abdomen in both the male and the female. If we have a close-up view of the abdomen, we can see there's numerous features which we can observe just on the surface. So this is without going into the abdominal cavity itself. And we can pick out a number of these features. Again, we can separate the abdominal cavity into this region here, which we're going to focus on. Specifically, we can see we have the umbilicus in the midline here, and then radiating superior and inferiorly away from the umbilicus, we have the linear alba. And this separates the abdomen to left and right sides. So we can see the umbilicus, we can see that here, and we can see that midline, the linear alba. Either side of the linear alba, we have a series of muscles which are radiating inferiorly down. These are running like strap-like muscles, either side of the midline. And these are our six packs. Some people may be able to see them depending on how much subcutaneous fat you have under your skin, but you can see that either side of the midline we have these indentations that give this region its characteristic six pack appearance. Lateral to these muscles we can see we've got this line running down here, separating the six pack from the more lateral musculature, which we'll cover in due course. And these are known as our semilunar lines. So we have the linear alba in the midline, we have the umbilicus, and then lateral to it, we have a pair of um, semilunar lines here and here. We can also see a few bony landmarks. So we have a structure on either side of the body known as the anterior superior iliac spine. And this is approximately here and here, and these are the structures which you're supposed to hang your trousers on, so your trousers are supposed to sit on these bony landmarks. And as we saw in the previous slide, these radiate um, structures from these regions radiate down to the midline where we find the pubic symphysis and the iliac crest. 
So from the anterior superior iliac spine, which we can see here, we then have the, in the midline, the iliac crest and the pubic symphysis. And running down, we see this slight depression, which indicates the inguinal ligament, and we just see it slightly depressed, and that's our inguinal groove. So these surface landmarks on the abdomen are really important in helping us observe this, if there's any scarring or if there's any um, damage being, that's, that's occurred to this region. But this is a nice normal anterior aspect of the abdomen. If we look at the anterior aspect of the abdomen, then superimposed onto this region are a number of lines which we've drawn on. And these actually divide the abdomen into numerous regions. And the lines that we've drawn on use the surface landmarks which we spoke about previously. So what we can see is that here we've got our abdomen, this region around here. We can see we've got our superior aspect up here, and we've got the inferior aspect down here. And we can use the landmarks which we spoke about previously to divide it up into various regions. So we can create this, uh, this sagittal or this vertical plane that runs down. If we look up here, we have our two clavicles. And if we look at the mid-clavicular line, this is a line which runs all the way down from the clavicle all the way down to the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. So the inguinal ligament is running in this direction, and we've got our clavicle here, and we have this mid-clavicular line that's running all the way down in this direction. We have one on this right side, and we also have another on this left side. And you can see this divides the abdomen into the three vertical bands. We've got one here, one here, and one here. We can also look at two transverse or horizontal planes that are going across the abdomen. We have one known as the subcostal plane that's running in this direction here, in line with the tenth costal cartilage that runs horizontally. And then we have another one known as the transtubercular line, which runs across here. And we can see this now divides the surface of the abdomen into nine regions. We can see we have a region here, here, and here. So we have one, two, three, and then we have three below, and then three below that. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And these regions are really important. Because you can teach people that deep to these specific regions we have certain organs, so that if pain is radiating in one of these regions, you have a good idea of which organ lies beneath it. So we can see in this midline here, we have what's known as the epigastric region, and then deep to that, by the umbilicus, we have the umbilical region. Inferior to the umbilical region again, we find we have the pubic region here. So we have epigastric, we have umbilicus, and we have a pubic region. And then lateral to these, so on either side of these, we have left and right versions. So here on this left-hand side, we have the left hypochondriac, and then on this side, we have the right hypochondriac. Inferior to those, and lateral to the umbilical region, we have the left lumbar, and we have the right lumbar regions. And then inferior to that again, we have the left inguinal region and we have the right inguinal region. So we know, for example, that down in this right inguinal region, our appendix is located. So if pain is, lo is radiating from this region, it's maybe an indication that we have appendicitis. We know that radiating in most of these regions, we have the small intestine. We know that up in this region here, we have the spleen. So through the course, we'll look at the position of these organs and how they can relate to the surface of the abdomen. So these surface landmarks and these abdominal regions and reference planes are really important. This is a cartoon which you're probably really familiar with as you've gone through your education and the just the idea of where the organs are within the abdominal cavity. So here we can see we've got the sternum here. Now we can see the xiphy sternum, this inferior limit of the sternum, which demarcates the superior aspect of the abdomen. And then we can see it radiating down in this direction with those costal
cartilages. We can see really clearly now, tucked up on this right-hand side, protected by the ribs, we've got the liver, this large organ, the largest gland in the human body. And in the midline, we can see just about we've got the stomach here, which is then continuous with what's called the duodenum, and that's the first part of the small intestine. But previously, I mentioned the appendix down in this lower right inguinal region. And here we can see in the lower right inguinal region, we can actually find the appendix. So these are really important landmarks which we can identify um, in the abdominal cavity. This is an anterior view. Over here, we've got a posterior view, and we can see where the kidneys are located either side of the vertebral column. We can also see tucked up over here, we have the spleen, which you can just about make out on this left-hand side. So we'll look at the various positions of these organs as we go through the course, but this provides a good general overview. So now we can relate the surface landmarks that we spoke about previously to a couple of these organs, like the liver and the appendix. Here we can start off with the appendix, this blind pouch that's located at the beginning of the large intestine by the cecum. And this is really important because, as I mentioned before, we may have radiating pain coming from this region. So a useful technique for locating this pain is to use what's known as McBurney's point. And this is a, a surface landmark for the appendix. So again, we can remind ourselves of where the umbilicus is. We can see it here. We can remind ourselves of where the anterior superior iliac spine is. And as we can see in the diagram, we can draw a line between these two regions. A third of the way from the anterior superior iliac spine towards the umbilicus, so about a third of the way across, we can locate our appendix. And that's known as McBurney's point. Palpation in this region can lead to quite severe acute pain, and this can indicate that the patient maybe has appendicitis. So that's where these surface landmarks are really important in being able to identify which organs lie deep to the skin. We can also see over on this side, again, mentioned it in the previous slide, the position of the liver. And here we can see that actually the liver is hard to palpate because most of the liver is actually covered by these ribs. And here this diagram may not be 100% correct in that it's quite unusual for the liver to actually be so clearly observed free of the ribs. It's usually only in patients that have an enlarged liver that it can actually radiate below the ribs. And to palpate the liver, you can feel this costal margin. And asking the patient to breathe in and out moves the liver. And you can actually, pressing on the skin deep to these ribs, can feel this edge of the liver pressing against your fingers. So it's really important that we mention the surface landmarks, as you can use them to try and feel and locate organs deep to the skin. So finally, getting towards the end of this initial introductory kind of surface anatomy lecture, I want to show this picture which may look slightly bizarre. But on, the, on this side here, we can see a male torso. And what's being drawn onto it are a series of horizontal bands, like you're wearing a, a hooped jumper. And these horizontal bands mark an area of the abdomen that is innervated via a specific spinal nerve. And on this side, we can see that we have these individual spinal nerves which are radiating from the spinal cord. So if we look here, we can see that we have these series of transverse bands. Here we can locate them as T10, T11, T12, L1. These are the regions of the spinal cord that these spinal nerves originate from. And what we can see is that we've also superimposed various organs. So here we can see we've got a region here, which is the stomach. We've got a region here, which indicates the liver and the gallbladder. This is important because this is where these organs, if they become inflamed or if they become damaged, radiate their pain to these specific nerves. And because the body is not used to feeling pain from the the stomach or from the intestines because they're busy functioning, 
The body assumes it's coming from that area of the skin, which it's used to feeling. You're used to touching your abdomen. So the brain is used to receiving sensation. So it's important, therefore, to understand where these organs refer their pain to the surface of the abdomen. And we'll explore this in later detail towards the end of this course. So in conclusion, in this initial introductory surface anatomy lecture, we've looked at numerous surface landmarks like the umbil umbilicus, the ziphi sternum, pubic symphysis, and that important bone, the anterior superior iliac spine. We've then used these regions to lo locate specific reference planes like the midclavicular, mid inguinal plane, subcostal, transtubercular, and how these divide up the anterior surface of the abdomen into numerous regions like the hypochondria, epigastric, lateral, lumbar regions, umbilical, inguinal, or pubic regions. And we looked briefly at the position of some general organs within these specific regions, specifically looking at the appendix and the liver. And then towards the end, we looked again briefly, but we'll come back to this throughout the course, the sensory distribution from the skin and also from the organs that lie deep to it. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the anterolateral abdominal wall. So on the screen, we can see we have the torso of a human which has had the skin removed to see the musculature and underlying fascia or fibrous tissue that is within the trunk. Specifically, in this lecture, we're going to look at a series of muscles that make up this abdominal wall, look at internal oblique, external oblique, transversus abdominis and rectus abdominis. We'll also look at their attachments, where they originate, where they insert, and what function, what movements they carry out, and what important roles they have for the correct functioning of the abdomen. We'll also look at some aponeuroses, which are the flattened tendons of these muscles, and we'll look at an important structure known as the rectus sheath. Throughout the lecture, we'll look at some important neurovascular structures, the arteries, the nerves, the veins of this region. And then very briefly, we'll introduce the inguinal region and specifically the inguinal canal. And in the next lecture, we'll look at this in a lot more detail. So let's start off with some basics of the anterolateral abdominal wall. Here we can see from anterior to posterior, we can see that most anteriorly, and what you can see when you take your your shirt off, is the skin. And we have this outer layer of skin, which we can see here. And deep to that layer of skin, we have some subcutaneous, some fatty tissue, which we can see in this layer here, which is immediately deep to the skin. And then in the more lateral aspect of the abdomen, so not where we spoke about the rectus abdominis muscles in the previous lecture, but more laterally, we find we have three layers of muscles, which we can see here, one, two, and three. These are our oblique muscles and our transverse abdominis muscles. We then find deep again, to before we get into the viscera of the abdominal cavity, the gastrointestinal tract, which is depicted here. We have a couple of layers, which are within this one line here, called transversalis fascia. That's an important layer when we look at the inguinal canal. And then finally, the peritoneum, which we'll talk about in detail in subsequent lectures. So this is just the basic outline of a section through the abdominal wall from superficial to deep. We've got fat, we've got skin, we've got muscles, and we've got important membranes before we get into the viscera. So if we have a look at this in a bit more detail, then we're just concentrating again on this region here in the male and in the female, this abdominal cavity. And we're stripping away the skin to look at the musculature that lies underneath. And this is what we can see in this cartoon here. We can orientate ourselves again. So we've got the ziphy sternum up here and down inferiorly in this region here. We've got the pubic symphysis and the pubic crest. And we can see a whole 
arrangement of muscles here. We can see rectus abdominis and we can see some musculature over on this lateral aspect. So let's go through these muscles individually. Let's start with external oblique. External oblique is an important muscle and its fibres run downwards and forwards. So we can see external oblique's fibres running in this direction. Like you're putting your hands in your pockets like this, running downwards and forwards towards the midline. They originate from the surfaces of the ribs 5 to 12, which we can see here, which I've noted. And also they insert down into the linear alba, this midline, here's the umbilicus again that we spoke about. And in this diagram, we've actually opened up this region here. So we can't exactly see where this muscle inserts, but it passes towards the midline and it attaches to the linear alba. It also runs down and attaches to the inguinal ligament, which is down here, and it runs and attaches to the iliac crest and the pubic tubercle. We'll cover this in more detail as we go through through. Previously I've mentioned some important nerves and the innervation of this muscle are the thoracoabdominal and subcostal nerves for, through T7 to 12. And these nerves again importantly run in this direction to supply external oblique and they allow the muscle to contract. The action of these muscles, why do we have these muscles, what's the importance of them, is to flex and to rotate the trunk. So movement of the trunk enables us to move from side to side, enabling us to flex our trunk. Importantly, and this is for all of the muscles which we'll cover, they enable the internal contents of the abdomen to be compressed. This is important when we defecate and if we vomit, how we can increase the pressure within the abdominal cavity by these muscles contracting, helping to expel feces, for example. Also, by doing this, they're putting pressure on the vertebral column. So as these muscles contract, they increase the pressure within the abdomen, and that effectively is like a, a football, a bag of air, sitting against the base of a tree, the tree being the vertebral column. And that helps to stabilise us and support our vertebral column to keep us upright. So this muscle, external oblique, is important. We've spoken about it before, and it's important in moving and supporting the function of the internal environment. A muscle we can also see on this slide is rectus abdominis. And this muscle we've spoken about before. This time we can see it quite clearly. It's fibres running down in this direction. It's coming from the ziphy sternum and the costal cartilages superiorly. And it runs either side of the linear alba. So we've got some details here of rectus abdominis. It's coming from the ziphy sternum and the costal cartilages, which we can see here. But it actually originates from the pubic symphysis down here in the pubic crest and its fibres are running vertically, we can see them here. Importantly, we have a whole series of these little cartilaginous breaks within the muscle and here we can see how they separate this band of muscle into various discrete regions and this gives it its characteristic six-pack appearance. And if you have limited amounts of subcutaneous fat, then these bands can be clearly identified and you generate that six-pack appearance like I've mentioned. So here we have rectus abdominis. Similar nerve supply for this muscle, the thoracoabdominal and subcostal nerves from T6 through to T12. And again, these nerves are coming in this direction and they go to innervate the strap muscles, either side of the linear alba. We have one over on this side as well. The action, similar to external oblique in that it helps to compress the internal viscera, but it's important in flexing the trunk. So to get a nice six pack, you often do your sit ups and that's this muscle reducing the space from the ziphy sternum down to the pubic symphysis. And by that, you're going to be doing your, your sit-ups, your stomach crunches. Let's move on and deep to this muscle, deep to external oblique, we find internal oblique. So here on the diagram, we can see external oblique here has been cut away and we're left with this muscle that's radiating underneath. So here we have some details. You can notice that the fibres of internal oblique run in the opposite direction to that of external oblique. And this is really important. 
So external oblique is running down in this direction, like you're putting your hands in your pockets. External oblique. We've got some details of its origin and its insertion here. It originates from the iliac crest, from the um, pelvic bone, and also an important piece of fascia, most posteriorly called your forico lumbar fascia. It also attaches to the inguinal ligament, and we'll see that in more detail when we look at the inguinal canal. As it's running up in this direction, we can see it inserts into ribs 10 and 12, and it also via some aponeuroses, which we'll talk about, the internal oblique muscles attached to the linear alba. Nerve supply, again, is similar to external oblique and rectus abdominis, and it's the thoracoabdominal nerves coming from the spinal cord T6 through to T12. Internal oblique does the same function as external oblique. It helps to flex and rotate the trunk, enabling us to, to move. And importantly, like I mentioned before, it helps to compress the internal viscera, increase the pressure and support the abdominal cavity. So we've got internal oblique that lies deep to external oblique. The final muscle I want to talk about Deep to internal oblique is transverse abdominus. And as its name suggests, transverse abdominus runs transversely, like a belt running across your abdomen. And here you can see we've got numerous muscles that have been reflected. So here we've got transverse abdominus. See, it's fibers running transversely. We can see them here. Again, it's going to go and attach to the linear alba. Here we can see the details on the screen. It's running to the midline linear alba where it attaches, where its aponeurosis attaches, and it originates from some ribs which we can see, the foraco-lumbar fascia once again, and importantly the lateral third of the inguinal ligament. So here we've got the um, origins and the insertions. Nerve supply again is very similar, T6 through to T12, these foraco-abdominal and subcostal nerves, and we can see these nerves are going to be running, importantly, in the space between transverse abdominus and internal oblique. So we have external oblique, we have internal oblique, transverse abdominus. And the nerves, these thoracoabdominal and subcostal nerves that are coming around, run in between these two muscles. Internal oblique, transversus abdominus. That's where the, the, the nerves will be located. Similar functions to the other muscles I've described. Helps to move the trunk, helps to compress and support the internal viscera. So these three muscles, external, internal, oblique, and transversus abdominis, ultimately go and insert into the linear alba. They have an attachment in the midline. And they do this by way of aponeuroses. Now aponeuroses are really important. They're just like a tendon, like your biceps attaches to your radius in your arm. We're very thin and quite... Um, strong tendon. But for these anterior lateral abdominal wall muscles, the tendon is very flat and forms a kind of fibrous sheath. And these are known as aponeuroses. And these aponeuroses form what's called the rectus sheath. And on the body plan, we can remember that we've got the midline running down here, and then we've got our semilunar lines. Remember those semilunar lines from the surface anatomy talk. Well, these semilunar lines form the lateral boundary of a structure known as the rectus sheath. We can see them here where we've got the midline, and we can make out the indentations of rectus abdominis, and then we have the semilunar lines here. And these form the boundaries of what's known as the rectus sheath. This is formed by the aponeuroses from these muscles coming around and interdigitating around rectus abdominis to unite in the midline. And we can see this here. Now this is a particularly complicated image, so I'll have to take some time in explaining it. But what we can see is a transverse section through the abdomen. So it's like someone's just chopped me in half, and you're looking down onto the cut surface. So we can see what we have is the posterior aspect, which is down here. So this is at your back. And then here, this is anteriorly here. So that's where your umbilicus is. This is in the midline here. So this is where your linear alba is going to be located. 
And what we have radiating from the posterior aspect are these anterolateral abdominal wall muscles. We can see we have three of them again. We have one, two, three. We have our external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis. We've got these three muscles. But what you notice is the actual muscle tissue, which is here in, in orange, doesn't run all the way to the midline. The musculature stops just before it gets to the rectus abdominis muscle here. So this is where we find our semilunar lines, just here. The lateral extension or the lateral boundary of the rectus sheath, of rectus abdominis muscle here. And what we find is that these aponeuroses from muscles external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis interdigitate around rectus abdominis as they pass towards the linear elbow in the midline. The formation of the rectus sheath differs, and this is where above and below comes in, it differ, differs if you're above or below the umbilicus. Now this is the level of the umbilicus, this here. This is the umbilicus just here. So if you're above the umbilicus, or if you're below the umbilicus, this arrangement is going to be different. So let's have a look. If we are above the umbilicus, we're looking at the details now of the rectus sheath above the umbilicus. And that's this one here. So imagine that this line here is coming, just like this one, coming from the posterior aspect. So it's taken higher up above the umbilicus. We're looking at the formation of the rectus sheath. We can see that here we have external oblique, here we have internal oblique, and here we have transverse abdominis. We can see that anterior, this is the rectus sheath, anteriorly, we have the aponeurosis of external oblique, and posteriorly, behind rectus abdominis, we have the aponeurosis of transverse abdominis. So anteriorly to the rectus abdominis muscle, we have the aponeurosis of external oblique, and posterior to rectus abdominis, we have the aponeurosis of transverse abdominis. So what happens to internal oblique? Well, the internal oblique muscle, as it approaches rectus abdominis, splits into two. So the aponeurosis of internal oblique splits into two lamina, an anterior lamina and a posterior lamina. So we have the anterior layer of internal oblique aponeurosis. Posteriorly, behind rectus abdominis, internal oblique sends a layer that goes behind rectus abdominis. So posterior, we have the posterior layer of internal oblique aponeurosis. So if we were to go from anterior to posterior, we'd find the aponeurosis of external oblique. We'd then find the anterior lamina, or the anterior layer of internal oblique. We'd then find rectus abdominis. Carrying on posterior, we'd then have the posterior lamina, or layer, of internal oblique. And then we'd have the aponeurosis of transversus abdominis. So effectively, we'd have one and a half anteriorly and one and a half posteriorly, where the two halves have come from internal oblique dividing. And then most posterior, we then have a fine layer, which is called transversalis fascia, and then we have the peritoneum. We'll explore those in later classes, in later lectures. So that's above the umbilicus. If we now go below the umbilicus, if we now go below the umbilicus, then this is a lot simpler. So previously we had the section above and now we've made a section below the umbilicus. So now we're concentrating on this one. Similar orientation of muscles. Here we've got rectus abdominis radiating around here. We're imagining that this is attaching to the posterior wall again. So a similar arrangement. But this time, the aponeurosis from all three anterolateral abdominal wall muscles all three, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, runs anteriorly. Internal oblique doesn't split, and transverse abdominis aponeurosis 
passes anterior to rectus abdominis. So the only thing we have posterior to rectus abdominis is that membrane I spoke about, transversalis fascia, and then the peritoneum. We can see it here. External oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis. We can see that the aponeuroses from these muscles all pass anterior to rectus abdominis. So we can see that above and below the umbilicus, the rectus sheath is very different. Above it, internal oblique is divided, a lamina goes anterior and a lamina goes posterior, and below the umbilicus, all three aponeuroses pass anterior to rectus abdominis to then merge with the linear alba. So that's the rectus sheath. It's very, very important arrangement. This view is slightly different. This view is as if we've cut down sagittally through the abdomen to have a look at these layers. So in this diagram, we've got anterior here and we've got posterior. And here we've got a reminder of those layers above and below the umbilicus. So here we see above the umbilicus and here we see below the umbilicus. So here on the diagram, this arrow is pointing to the umbilicus. So the umbilicus will be about here. And then we can see above it and we can see below it. Above the umbilicus, we had external oblique. Okay, so we had external oblique. So we can draw in external oblique. And that's going to be indicated here in blue. This blue line here is external oblique. In orange, we can see the skin of the body. So external oblique is anterior to rectus abdominis. Here we can see rectus abdominis muscle. If we look below the umbilicus, external oblique is still there. So now we're below the umbilicus, external oblique is still present. It just always lies anteriorly. If we go deep to external oblique, pick it up in green here, we can see that we've got internal obliques anterior layer. Because also in green, above the umbilicus, we can see internal obliques posterior layer. So here we have internal oblique, internal oblique. It's anterior and posterior layers. Where remember, above the umbilicus, it's divided. What we can also see if we keep going posterior is transverse abdominis. In purple here, we can see transverse abdominis. And this is above the umbilicus. And then most posteriorly again, we can see transversalis fascia here in black, which is then the peritoneum. So importantly, above the umbilicus, we can see we've got external oblique, anterior layer of internal oblique, rectus abdominis. We've got the posterior layer of internal oblique, and then we've got the transversus abdominis, and then transversalis fascia. Just below the umbilicus, we can see that rectus abdominis muscle penetrates these layers. So we can see rectus abdominis is penetrating these layers so that it actually pierces them and lies posterior to these layers. So now that we're below the umbilicus, you can see we have external oblique, internal oblique, the anterior and posterior lamina have merged, and we can see we have transverse abdominis. If we were to look, if we were to stand in the abdomen and look at the anterior abdominal wall from the inside, we could see this transition. We could see this transition, and it's known as the arcuate line. Here we can see this arrow is indicating what's known as the arcuate line. And that's where you have this covering posteriorly of rectus abdominis, which then disappears. And hopefully, you can appreciate that when we look at a posterior view of the anterolateral abdominal wall. If you're familiar with the thoracic cavity, then you'll be familiar with this diagram because we can see here we have our two subclavian arteries. And running down from the subclavian artery, we have two what are known as internal thoracic arteries. These two internal thoracic arteries that run either side of the sternum. Now, once they get to about the sixth costal cartilage where it attaches to the 
um, sternum. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So around about here on either side. Then this internal thoracic artery divides. Divides into a blood vessel that goes around here and supplies the diaphragm. That's the muscular phrenic artery. We won't worry too much about that as yet. But internal thoracic divides muscular phrenic around here, and then it carries on as the superior epigastric artery. Carries on as the superior epigastric artery, which run down in this direction. As we get towards the end of the course, we're going to look at the branches of the internal iliac artery, but we'll jump to that quite quickly now. And here we can see the iliac blood vessels. And the iliac blood vessels will divide into internal, external, supply the organs of the pelvis, and then go on to supply the um, lower limb. But an important branch coming up is inferior epigastric, this one here. This inferior epigastric artery is running up in this direction. And that's the blood vessel we saw on the previous slide, which we can see running up in this direction, inferior epigastric. Inferior epigastric is then going to anastomose with superior epigastric. And that's where these two arteries are going to join. They join together to form a, a complete circuit. These are really important as they go on to supply the muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall. There are other smaller blood vessels, which... If you're interested, you could look up. You have various other blood vessels that come off in this region to supply the musculature. But these epigastric regions run, um, epigastric blood vessels run within the rectus sheath. I've mentioned the nerves. And again, these nerves are going to be running from the spinal cord in the vertebral column at your back, and they're going to be running all the way around. And these nerves run around in this direction to supply the musculature. Obviously, similar happens in both the male and the female. And this is just a cartoon of what this looks like. Here we've got the spinal cord, and we can see coming off the spinal cord, we have these two pairs of spinal nerves. We've just got one here and one here. This happens all the way up and down the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is divided into 31 segments. And here we're just looking at two of these segments giving rise to a pair of spinal nerves, one coming in this direction, one coming in this direction. As I mentioned throughout the um, lecture, the nerves that supply these muscles come from T7, T11, your thoracoabdominal nerves, and subcostal nerve, which is T12. This could be T12 here, and then the one directly inferior to it could be L1. And importantly, what we can see is that these nerves are branching round. They run in between internal oblique and transverse abdominus muscle layers. But we also have some cutaneous branches, and these go to supply the skin. And that's what creates this banding, creates the dermatomes, the sensory distribution um, from the skin. So when you touch, the sensation travels back towards the spinal cord. So here we can see some of those thoracoabdominal nerves. Importantly, I mentioned when we looked at the muscles, the various movements of the trunk, and here we can just see where we have the various movements that these muscles contribute. So we have lateral bending where you can see the, the trunk is moving um, to the left and to the right, moving laterally. You can see we have extension and you can see we have flexion carried out, let's say, by rectus abdominis. This is similar to the sit-up position. And then we have rotation where the body is rotating around, obviously. All of these muscles, all these movements are coordinated by some, if not all, of those anterolateral abdominal wall muscles. So important movements of the trunk. So in summary, in conclusion, we've looked in quite a lot of detail about the origin, the insertion and the innovation of a whole series of muscles, which we can see here, external, internal obliques, transversus abdominis and rectus abdominis, those important muscles, and how those muscles were arranged to form the rectus sheath. And then towards the end, we've looked at the epigastric vessels, superior, inferior, and the thoracoabdominal nerves that um, innovate them. And then finally, we looked at movement, the bending, flexing, extending, and rotating of the trunk. These muscles are really important when we come next to look at the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is an important passageway located in the inguinal region. And these muscles form a complex channel that allows important structures to pass through. And we'll look at that next.